to our show, which we entitled The Lord Among Us. Each week I invite you to attend uh, and watch this program, and we speak about the relationship of ourselves with God and one another. We hope thereby to strengthen our spiritual lives, to grow in holiness and in service to God and those about us. My subject today is going to be on baptism and the things that brought it about and why it's necessary. But before I get into that subject, as is our custom, we're going to have an opening hymn sung for us by St. Lucy's Choir of Huma. Then I will be back. My dear friends in Christ, as I said in my introduction, we're going to talk today about baptism. What it means to the Christian, how necessary it is for us, what it does to us, and why we have to have it. But you can't understand baptism unless you understand the reason why we have it. And that takes us back a long, long time. In fact, it takes us back to the very earliest known history of mankind as recorded in the book of Genesis. We read in that book the story of creation. It tells us that God created the heavens and the earth and all things, the fishes of the sea, the birds of the air. And finally, because he saw nothing quite like himself and because he wanted to share his life in some way with, with other creatures that he was to create, he said, let us make man to our own image and likeness. And so the Bible tells us, to the image of God he made him. He formed man from the slime of the earth and breathed into him, breathed into him the breath of life and man became a living soul. Well, he wasn't like God in that he was a spirit or uh, had, could do all things or could himself create. But he was like God in more than the other animals or the fish or the birds in that God gave him intelligence, a high grade of intelligence, not just instinct as he gave the animals, and free will. Man is the only living creature on earth, this is the way from the angels, who can choose, has the real ability and power to choose. That was his blessing, but is also his greatest danger. Now we're coming pretty closely. So God took man and he said finally, well, it's not good for man to be alone, so you know the story, he created the woman. God placed them in a garden of pleasure, we are told. We call it the garden of Eden. All sorts of beauties, of life, all the good fruit and things people could eat. Except one tree said, don't eat from this tree. If you eat the fruit of this tree, you shall die. Now, scripture scholars tell us that's a symbolism of merely a law demanding their obedience. I'm not going to get into that. I'm going to tell you the story as the Bible tells it. Okay. Oh, they were going to do that for sure. 
but they didn't. They disobeyed God, they ate of the fruit, whatever it was, and that was sin. Because sin is an act of disobedience against God. Because of it, they were driven from the garden of paradise. God said to the woman, in labor shall you bring forth your children. He said to Adam, within the sweat of your brow you shall eat your bread until you return to the dust from which you came, because dust you are, and unto dust you shall return. The effects of sin, death. The worst effect of sin is death. The second is that because of the sin of our first parents, as we call them, Adam and Eve, we are all born with sin. Oh, but you say, that's not fair. I didn't do anything. Why should that innocent baby be born with sin? Well, you know, science helps us in some surprising ways. In recent years, we hear a lot about genes. When I was a boy, you never heard about genes, except uh, certain kind of clothes to wear, and then not much about that. The scientists tell us that there are certain things which we inherit from our physical things, um, which determine whether I'm, uh, whether I'm going to be fat or skinny, or whether I'm going to be well or sick, whether I'm going to be inclined for cancer, or heart attacks, or good health. You see, someone says to me, but boy, you, you're thin. I said, I've always been thin. They say, it must be in your genes. I'm not sure what genes are, but it's something we inherit from our parents, or our grandparents, or our great-parents, or our great-great-parents, which determine certain things in our lives. We accept that as a scientific fact. Why should we be surprised, then, that we inherit sin? You might call it the spiritual genes which we inherit from our first parents, and we do. We call it original sin because it was the first sin committed. Well, sin makes man the enemy of God. So there had to be some way whereby man could be saved. Well, the rest of the story is before he cast Adam and Eve from the garden, he promised them a savior. He said, I will place enmity between thee and the woman, he said to, Eve, to, the, to the serpent, to the devil. He, sh he shall snap at your heel and you shall crush his head. And finally, that Savior came after long, long centuries. We'll talk about this some other time. After long centuries, he came. He had to come. And what was the means whereby we were to become part of his kingdom, part of Christianity, part of that way of salvation which he came to give us? Baptism, was it? The kind of an initiation. Now, we're familiar with initiations. I don't know whether colleges still have initiation of freshmen, but it used to be ridiculous and sometimes very dangerous. I'd rather think about those initiations into societies, serious ones like the Knights of Columbus, uh, the Masons, uh, Women of the World, the Catholic Daughters, which are initiations which introduce the, the prospective members to the purposes of, the ideals of that particular organization and make, have them make a commitment to do it. So the initiation into the kingdom of God, which Jesus himself established and required, note I said and required, is baptism. Now why do I say that? Listen to this. First of all, therefore through one man, Adam, sin entered to the world, and through sin, death, and thus death has passed into all men because all have sinned. That's the original sin. We just explained it like the genes, like the spiritual genes. All right. So we are born not with any personal guilt, but, but some kind of a state of guilt, which we get not from ourselves, but from the spiritual genes, if you will, of our parents. That's why Jesus had to come. And that's why the apostles said from the very beginning in the preaching of Jesus, repent and believe the gospel and be baptized. You had to repent, you had to believe, and you had to be baptized. After Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit had descended upon the apostles, and these fearful men, as we've pointed out many times, who had been gathered, hiding in an upper room, were strengthened by the power of the Holy Spirit, Peter went out and preached to the crowds. He told them what had happened, how they had killed the Savior of the world, who was really there, the Son of God. And they, were, they said, what can we do? This was his answer. Repent 
and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So if that sin was to be forbid forgiven, then we had to be baptized. Jesus himself said, unless a man be born again of water, baptism, and the Holy Spirit, which comes to us through baptism, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. When he sent forth his disciples, he said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, baptizing them, the command of Jesus, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Even today, you cannot enter the kingdom of God, you cannot enter the church unless you are baptized. It's a kind of a rebirth. If someone asks you, have you been reborn? Say, yes, I was baptized. It's a new birth. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, Jesus said. I was baptized. I'm sure all of you here listening have been baptized. You were born again, a new creation, a spiritual creation. Water and the Holy Spirit, unless he be baptized, you cannot enter the kingdom of God. So the command to go and make disciples, baptizing them, is still fulfilled every day of the year in some parish church or some mission in some part of the world when someone is baptized at the command of Jesus and becomes a member of the, of the kingdom of God and a Christian. You know, you might say, well, why do I have to go through this? There is a uh, opinion among scripture scholars, and I'm not sure I accept it, but it's interesting, that when Jesus washed the feet of his disciples, at the Last Supper. It was a symbolism of the baptism in this sense. You remember Peter said, oh Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus said, Simon, if I do not wash your feet, you shall have no part of me. And Peter said, oh, then wash my head and my hands too. So just as we, he let Peter know he could not become part of him unless he washed his feet, Unless we become washed with the water of baptism, we cannot become part of the kingdom and part of the mystical body of Jesus Christ. Now there's another reason. Why did he choose water? Water is cleansing. We use water to wash our hands, to wash our cars, to wash our floors, to brush our teeth, we use water, and toothpaste, of course. And so water is cleanses. Jesus used the simplest thing that people could understand water. So when the water is applied, the water itself, in a sense, does not wash away because you can't touch the spiritual. But because of that act, God in his plan effects the cleanliness as the, and the other sins are, as we say, washed away. Water also reminds us of the origin of life, a new life. Scholars tell us today, and I think it's true, that all life began in the ocean. Now that's a scientific theory. Someday we'll talk about that, but if you read the Bible carefully, water and the fish were the first things God created, and then all the other things were created. Think about it. So, okay, water was used because it's a sign of new life, and it's a sign of cleansing. Well, we're going to take a break now, my dear friends, have another mid-talk hymn by our St. Lucy's Choir, then I will be back to continue the talk on baptism.
My dear friends in Christ, I'm grateful to St. Lucy's Choir for their presence on our program, and we do thank them very much. Uh, in my talk on baptism, in the first segment of my talk today, we're speaking about uh, that baptism is a sort of a new birth. We are reborn into the gospel. We're born into the into union with Christ. We have become citizens of the kingdom of God, so to speak, and members of his household, as St. Paul says. But St. Paul sees in, he sees in baptism, besides being a new life, the manner in which we get that new life, or how he describes it. And this is what he says. It's a kind of new life whereby, by a burial with Christ and arising with him. Now, what does he mean by burial? Well, that was expressed in the early ceremony of immersion. Uh, you know it's clear from the gospel when Jesus was baptized by John, and when John was baptizing people, they went to the river. They were, if I may, may use the word, they were immersed, or if you will, they were dunked into the river to, so they could not be seen. It's like they had died. And uh, then when they come up from the water, like they've come to new life. So that was the symbolism of the immersion. Death symbolized in uh, their bodies being covered by the water, and coming out of the water, a new life. That's what St. Paul means when he says this. Do you not know that all we who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? Into his death. The symbolism of the water, being covered by the water. For we believe that if we have died with Christ, we shall also live together with Christ. Interesting, huh? It's kind of burial. So immersion was probably listen to my words carefully, probably the normal way of baptism in the early, early church, but not always. And let me tell you why. Do you believe that on that first Pentecost Sunday, when we are told that some 3,000 people were received into the church, when Paul said, believe and be baptized, do you think they were all dunked into the river? I don't see how they could have done it. Probably, they sprinkled water upon them, or we, what we call infusion, or poured water upon their heads, with having to have everybody go into the, to the, to the river. They probably did. Now we have reason for believing that because, in one of the earliest Christian writers, in a book called the Didache, which was written about the year 100, which we refer to often in the early history of the church to prove that what we believe today in the church. The church believed even in the time of the apostles. The Didache, the Didache, Didache speaks, it's the first one who clearly speaks about what you might call uh, baptism by infusion. It says, if you have no running water, and this is baptism, if you have no running water, no river, no stream, pour water on the head. Now this was the practice within those who probably knew Christ, young people who knew Christ, within their lifetime. The custom was that if they didn't have running water, sometimes they baptized people in their homes. Remember the time that Paul was in, that, in prison at Philippi? And by a miracle, the, a sort of earthquake came and broke their chains, and, and the jailer saw that the chains were broken, and he was about to kill himself because he would be responsible for what he thought was the escape of the prisoners. And Paul said, no, look, we're all here. Don't kill yourself. We're all here. We're safe. Don't worry. You didn't fail your job. Well, then the man knew that uh, there was a miracle. So he believed. Paul said, what must I do to be saved? And Paul said, be baptized. And we are told that the jailer and his family were baptized right there. In the jail, there was no running water. There was no river. Probably took water from some old faucet and poured it on their head and baptized them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I think we can safely say in the church, particularly in the Catholic Church, where infusion was very common for many centuries, though some churches are going back, and it's valid to, to immersion in the baptistry pools. Uh, anyway, whatever it may be, it's a valid baptism and it's necessary. But the reason that I wanted to point out today was simply that the early church, indicating valid theological and liturgical principles, 
had baptism by immersion or going into the water, by pouring or by ablution or by infusion or sprinkling. Those three means were valid means. Of, as long as the water symbolically touched the person, that symbolism, the same as being dunked in the river, was sufficient. And if they were agreed to be baptized, and the proper words were said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, because that's what Jesus said, go baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and those people were baptized. So, my dear friends, it's very interesting. But this shows, first of all, we saw how baptism became necessary, became necessary because man had sinned. We were all born with original sin from the spiritual genes, we said, which we inherit through, through the centuries, as we inherit genes which affect whether we're going to have a heart attack or whether we're going to be skinny or fat or intelligent or be inclined to this disease or free from that disease. So that's it. So we've put on Christ. That's another way we speak of baptism. We have, we have put on Christ. Conformed to Christ, the Christian is made accessible then again by having sin removed from his life and living a life pleasing to God. Not only does he become a friend of God, he becomes part, part of Christ's mystical body. St. Paul speaks of what he calls the mystical body of Christ. He says, do you not know that you are the body of Christ and members of member? Well, we're not the physical body of Christ in heaven or in the Eucharist. But we are the mystical body of Christ, the strange mystery of, the, of Christianity. We are the body of Christ and members of member. Isn't that interesting? Yes, it's very interesting. So in summary then, we can say that baptism makes us members of the church, enables us to take part in our liturgical services. We said many times before that in the early church, when catechumens came, that is those who were being instructed to be Christians, They'd come to the liturgy, which we call the Mass today. They could listen to, to the reading of the Word, but when it came time for the Eucharistic celebration, or what we, what we call now the, um, yeah, the Eucharistic celebration, or receiving communion, they had to leave. Why? Because they were not yet baptized. They were not yet empowered to be part of full Christian life. My dear friends, this proverb brings us to the end of uh, my first talk on baptism, but it's such a vast subject and so fundamental, I thought that we would uh, go to the subject again next week if you care to listen. But let's summarize again what I've said because we don't have much more time and I don't want to start that new subject. We said baptism is the means we have of removing sin from our lives. It became necessary because our first parents have sinned. We inherit that sin through what we call the spiritual genes. We were by nature the children of wrath, St. Paul tells us, but we are restored to children of light through baptism. Condition of guilt was in us. We lose that guilt through baptism. That's why Jesus had to come. The promised Messiah had to come to crush the head of the serpent, to overcome the power of sin. The first preaching of Jesus, we said, was repent and be baptized. And that's still the basic mission of the church, to repent, to teach the gospel, and to baptize. Because unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Now there are certain groups, I don't condemn them, who tell us, come to me, I've said some time in visiting sick people in the hospital, have you been born again? Oh, I said, they think I belong to that. I said, oh yes, I've been born again. I was baptized when I was very small. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit. That's the rebirth Jesus is talking about. I'm sure that most of you have been. Now what we want to do, my dear friend, as best we can, is to keep the innocence of that washing, of that baptism in our lives, until we all are reunited in heaven to enjoy eternal life with him who came to give us baptism and to save us from sin and death. Until next week then, God bless and keep you.
and I'm very pleased once again to welcome you to our weekly program on this station entitled The Lord Among Us. Each week we talk about some religious subject directly or indirectly affecting your life and mine, our relationship with God, with one another, and the earth about us. Last week I spoke of baptism at some length because it's, a, because it's such a fundamental issue in Christian life and so essential. I'm going to talk about that again this week but in a different way and I will tell you how when we come back but, but it is our custom we're going to have an opening hymn this time now by our joyful horse choir from Huma, Louisiana. <laughs> My dear friends in Christ, I want to express my gratitude to the Joyful Hearts Choir for their kindness in being on our program, and we thank them for their nice songs. Last week we spoke about baptism, at length actually, uh, because it's so important and so fundamental to the Christian life, to our incorporation into the mystical body of Christ, we said, into fulfilling the commandment of God, Jesus that we all be baptized and in being uh, freed from sin, original sin. Today I'm going to refer to not any new doctrine from what I said last week, but I want to uh, quote to you from the scripture itself, the theology upon which my talk last week was drawn, which I believe and hope it to be this true and complete theology of the Catholic Church on baptism, which by the way, is fundamentally the same as all, uh, as all other Christian churches. We spoke about the command that Jesus gave that made it clear that we all had to be baptized if we were to be saved. So he gave a command, we said, and I'm going to give you, if you have a pen around or you want to keep this to check on it, or if you teach catechism in your church or religion, you may want to write some of these texts down to use on this subject. Um, I'll give you the source. Uh, we said Jesus made it necessary that we be baptized, and when he sent his disciples out, he gave them that command. He said, Going, therefore, teach you all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And that's from the Gospel of Matthew, the 28th chapter, verse 19. Now, again, Jesus speaks in the Gospel of John. This is chapter 3, verse 5. Unless a man be born again of water and of the Holy Ghost, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. As we pointed out last week, water is the symbol of cleanliness and uh, the beginning of life. And that's why Jesus so showed that simple available facility thing which everybody could have. And when it applied, then God 
apply the graces of, uh, of, of baptism. Once when speaking to the crowds, trying to convert them, Peter was surprised to find that they seemed all of a sudden to have received the Holy Spirit. Now Peter wasn't too strong on the uh, Gentiles at first. That was, the, that was the work of Paul. Paul went to the Gentiles, but Jesus did too, but not as much as Paul. He was a little skeptical about it. He still believed that salvation was for the Jews only. But he, he couldn't believe that because he had been taught differently, so he tried to break through. He did eventually. So he was preaching one day to them, and he got signs. He said to himself, as I understand it, you know, I think these people have received the Holy, Vir Holy Spirit. So this is what we, he said, recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 10, verse 27. Can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized who receive the Holy Ghost as well as we? Now he's admitting the Gentiles can receive the Holy Spirit. And he commanded them, Peter, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Of course, why do you think God gave us baptism? He didn't have to love us, but he did. Even after man's sin, he loved us. St. Paul, writing to the Ephesians, reminds us of that, and I don't want us to forget it. Christ loved the church. He loved the church and delivered himself up for it, gave his life in a most agonizing death for it, that he might sanctify it, cleansing it by the labor of water. All the virtue of all the sacraments, baptism, confirmation, Eucharist, all of them, the power come from the cross. That empowered the church in the name of Jesus to do all the rest of it. St. Peter has an interesting thing. He refers to something involving water and uh, in the Old Testament, Noah's Ark. You know, the people had grown so evil that God planned to dis destroy the world by water. But he directed um, 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 Noah to build this ark and to bring the living creatures on it and his sons and their wives. And this is what Peter says, again applying the fact that water saved them from the rest of the world, which was so sinful, and baptism saves us, saves us from sin. Peter writes in the, the first epistle, chapter 3, verse 20, if, you, if you're taking notes. In the ark, eight souls were saved, that is, Noah, his wife, and their sons and daughters, and their and wives. Whereupon baptism being in the life form now saves you also. They were saved by the ark, water, Baptism, water, saves us. One day Philip, Philip was one of the deacons. He was, he was uh, obeying Christ's demand to go and teach. One day Philip was preaching the kingdom of God to, to Gentiles, trying to bring converts to the church. This too is recorded in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 12. And uh, he saw that they believed. When they believed Phil, Philip's preaching, we read here, about God's kingdom, in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Interesting, huh? When, when, when Philip was convinced they believed the word, now was the time for them to enter the church. They were baptized, both men and women. That Philip did a lot of good, you know. One day, he was walking along, and this uh, Ethiopian came in a chariot. And the man was reading the Bible. He had come to visit to Jerusalem, to visit Jerusalem. He got, a, he got the Word of God, uh, actually the Old Testament, which was available. The New Testament was not available. It wasn't written at this time yet. He was reading the Old Testament. He couldn't understand it. And he stopped and he asked Philip. Well, Philip got into the chariot with him and explained to him this, what, the, what the Old Testament meant. It was foretelling the coming of Jesus. So uh, then the... the uh, then he told him about baptism and Jesus dying upon the cross, and God gave him the gift of faith. So uh, Philip said, look, I can, this guy's ready, so to speak. He didn't use that language, but he said, this man's ready for, to become a member of the kingdom. So he, Peter, I mean, he, Philip, commanded the chariot to stand still. And they both went into the water. That's the immersion we talked about uh, last week. Both Philip and the eunuch, the, the, Philip, the Ethiopian was a eunuch, and he baptized him. You see, baptism was always the first act of Christian adoption and Christian membership, the baptism. 
Paul himself had to be baptized. Interestingly enough, I find no record in the Bible where any of the apostles were baptized, but I'm sure they were. They had to be, because everybody has to be baptized. Now, whether Jesus baptized them, or whether he baptized one, and that one baptized the others, or whether he gave them some special baptism, I do not know, but they had to be baptized. Same was true of Paul, you see. Well, I never saw read where Paul was ever baptized. Okay, then go back to the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 8, verse 18. After Paul had been driven from his horse on the way to Damascus, you know the story, he was going to bring the, put the Christians in jail. He fell from his horse. He said, Lord, who are you? And the voice said, I am Jesus whom you persecute. Well, he, he, well, he lost his sight. They had to lead him into Damascus. When he got to Damascus, Jesus appeared to uh, one of the Christians and said, go to such and such a man on street, on, on, on street, street, he's waiting for you. So he goes there, he finds Paul, a man was blind. And Paul tells him what happens. And the man says to him, the Lord Jesus sent me to you, that if you believe, you can be saved. And Paul says, I believe. And, and this is what we read. Immediately there fell from his eyes as it were scales, and he received his sight. Once his blindness achieved its purpose, by, which Jesus determined was to give him the gift of faith, God restored his sight. And listen to this. And rising up, he was baptized. Even though he had this special favor from, from Jesus, special grace to have this all, all this happen to him in the most remarkable sense, it didn't happen to you and to me, he still had to be baptized. Unless a man be born again of water and the Holy Spirit, Jesus said he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, my dear friends, I'm going to, I, I'm going to take a break right now because we have just one minute left for this first section. Before I continue this, because I want to, the next step is, our text is rather long. So we'll take our mid-talk break. We'll hear our mid-talk hymn, and I'll be back for the last and closing section of this two-part series on the subject of baptism. Ah. Uh -huh. 
My dear friends in Christ, I want to conclude this subject today, and uh, though there's much more that could be said, I want to bring out three points if I have time. One is uh, what, this, what the baptism of John meant and how it was not enough. Secondly, the spiritual significance of baptism. And finally, a brief uh, explanation of the symbolism of the ceremonies of baptism. First of all, that the baptism of John, though it was a real baptism, was only in preparation for the baptism of Jesus. We we'll read, for example, in the Gospel of Mark, chapter 1, verse 4. John was in the desert baptizing and preaching the baptism of repentance. And there went out to him all the country of Judea and all the of Jerusalem, and were baptized by him in the river of the Jordan, confessing their sins. Again, we read in Acts 18.25, This man was instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit spoke, and taught diligently the things that are of Jesus, but knowing only the baptism of John. So there were those baptized by John. John himself let them know that this was not enough, that they had to be baptized by Jesus after his. Uh, then they all went out to him, Jerusalem and all Judea, this is to John, and all the country, and were baptized by John in the Jordan, confessing their sins. And, and John said to them, I indeed baptize you in water unto repentance, but he that shall come after me is mightier than I, whose shoe I am not worthy to loosen. He shall baptize you in the Holy Spirit and in fire. So John himself admits that uh, the baptism of Jesus was necessary. And again we read in the Acts of the Apostles, the first chapter, verse 5, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized, Jesus said, with the Holy Ghost, not many days hence. Okay, then briefly, the significance of baptism. And this is a reference to some of the, something I said in my talk last week about the theology of it. This is merely to corroborate it by word from the, from the scripture. Know you not that all of us who have been baptized in Christ Jesus are baptized in his death? We are buried together with him by baptism unto death. That is, Christ is risen from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in newness of life. Baptism challenges us to a new life and to walk in that newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of death, then also we should be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old selves are crucified with him, and that the body of sin has been destroyed, and that we must serve sin no longer. That's the significance of our baptism. There are many other things, but that's the key. Now just quickly, if you ever attend a baptism, at least a Catholic baptism, you know that there's a time in the ceremony when the, uh, the pre priest breathes on the infant or the person baptized. Now the reason for this is to show that baptism is going to give them new life. When, uh, on, when God created man, we told he breathed into him the, spirit, the, the breath of life. That's Genesis chapter 2, 7. He breathed into his face the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And in Ezekiel the prophet foretells that, Say to the Spirit, Thus saith the Lord God, Come, Spirit, from the four winds, and blow upon those slain, and let them live again. So this was a new life by the blowing and the breathing uh, upon, the, upon the child. Now the sign of the cross, of course, is the symbol uh, of Christian. It's, it's like a... It's like a it's like a flag. We make the sign of the cross to prove we believe in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and in the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross. So the sign of the cross is used in, in baptism. The salt. The salt, a little pinch of salt is put in the baby's tongue, uh, or the, uh, whoever's uh, baptized. And that has also a scriptural background, because Jesus said to, to his followers, you are the salt of the earth. And this is to remind the baby and at least the godparents, so they can teach the child later on that he is the salt of the earth. He must help to change the world and make it pleasing to God's taste. Now there are the exorcisms, that is, the calling forth of the evil spirits. Sin is caused by the devil. And so exorcism means that we cast the devil out. 
holy oil is used. We anoint the child twice, on the breast and on the, on the forehead. And there again, that's based upon the fact that oil is used as a sign of being set apart for something holy. And when we baptize, we're being set apart for something holy, a holy life, holy functions. We'll talk more about that when we speak about confirmation. A white garment is placed upon the child, a small cloth, you're, you're familiar with it. Symbol, to symbolize now that, 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 that the child is innocent and white. We ask Jesus to, we ask God to forgive our sins and make them as white as snow. He said to us, though thy sins be as scarlet, I shall make them as white as snow. So white is the symbol of freedom from sin. So we place this cloth upon the baby or upon the shoulder of the one to be baptized, man or woman or child, and, we, and as a symbol that now they are washed clean of sin, they are white and they are pure. The lighted candle, there again. Just as the Jesus said, you are the salt of the earth, he also said to them, you are the light of the world. That is, we're not only called upon to change the world as God wants it to be changed, just as salt changes the taste of food, but we are called upon to be lights. Why do you put a light on in a room so you can see where you're going? We must be lights that people can see where they should be going, the way of Jesus Christ. Like the old song says, and I still think it's beautiful, I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. No turning back. So my dear friends, I hope I haven't overdone the baptism subject, but it's so fundamental to us all. Remember, we will be we are baptized and thank God for it. Because unless a man is born of water and the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That gives us a great privilege and a great dignity, but also a great challenge. Because as we saw in the ceremonies of baptism, we must be the salt of the earth, the light of the world. We must change the world as salt changes food taste, and we must be a light people can follow unto eternal life. Until next week then, enjoy the fact that you are baptized and live as a baptized person should. God bless you. Mm -hmm.